I would like to thank Gizmo Hay's amazing Photoshop skills for that awesome opening. Hello, fellow Jerry Cans. Whenever someone says, I love Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, or I love the Generation 4 Sinnoh games, they're fucking lying. Liar! What they're actually saying is, I love Pokemon Platinum, and only Platinum out of Gen 4 Sinnoh games. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl may be the actual worst game in this series. Yes, I'm saying it's worse than Sword and Shield, the heavily outdated Generation 1 Pokemon games, and even goddamn Pokemon Ultra Scat and Ultra Vomit. Those who unironically say they love Pokemon Diamond and Pearl either are people who played it in their childhood and not recently, people who don't realize a lot of us's stuff from Sinnoh is from Platinum not the DP games, or people blinded by their instant rose colored nostalgia glasses. Like, Diamond and Pearl is one of the most miserable games to sit through and play. When you're watching this review, I bet you there'll be many things that will make you say, wait, that's from Platinum only and was it in Diamond and Pearl? Because so many of you forgot how bad Diamond and Pearl was or is mixing up things with DP and Platinum. Yes, Diamond and Pearl had good map design. It brought innovation into the franchise by giving each attack move special and physical split. Yes, it was the first online Pokemon game so revolutionary. All of these things are good, but it was bogged down by bugginess or being rushed or unfinished. In my eyes, Diamond and Pearl is a downgrade from the Generation 3 Pokemon games that was a terrible first title in the series for the Nintendo DS. On the contrary, I would rank Pokemon Platinum as one of the best Pokemon games of all time. It's up there on the pantheon of great Pokemon games alongside Emerald, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and Black and White 2. 
Pokemon Platinum is truly a game that fixed almost all issues, added several new features, and saved Generation 4 Pokemon. My goal for today is to separate your mixed memory between Pokemon DP and Platinum, to split the two very different games with very different qualities. Many people lump them together as one, and that's really unfair for Pokemon Platinum. While I admit Platinum is not a perfect game which do have problems, the upcoming remakes Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are trying to be FAITHFUL to the original DP games as much as possible. And it is quite possibly the worst game in the entire series to be fucking faithful. I mean, why copy a fucking broke, incomplete mess of a game, when a game that fixed almost every problem and added more exists? So before the remakes come out, let's take a look back at the games Junichi Masuda wants you to forget ever existed. Today is a straight art review of Pokemon Platinum version released on the Nintendo DS in 2008. Part 0, The Third Game Dilemma Before I talk about this game though, I feel I need to address the debacle that is the third Pokemon game. I think I said this in my previous videos, but I prefer third games over DLCs like Sword and Shield. Yes, selling the same game but with updates with new features for the same price is a bit shady, and I will see why some people would prefer a DLC over a third game. But traditionally, except for motherfucking USUM, third games have always been the best games in the series. With DLCs, you may add new content in the game, but you can't fix things that didn't work in the first games and polish the game. Pokemon USUM is the worst example of a third game in the series because it worsened from the original Alola games and barely added new stuff. Go check out my USUM review for the full story of why it's so bad if you don't understand because that game ruined Alola. Pokemon Platinum, on the other hand, is probably the best example of a third game, because it made very frustrating bad games good. Now, you may still call me a sucker for liking third games, but hear me out. Like, did you ever hear the tragedy of Pokemon X and Y, the incomplete? It's not a story Sun and Moon will tell you. It's a French legend. Pokemon X and Y and Diamond and Pro are eerily very similar games. Both were launch games on a Mew console, a game that used the Mew engine, was optimized as hell, featured an angsty villain that wanted to destroy the world for legendary Pokemon, and most importantly, felt incomplete and more like a graphical test. Pokemon X and Y are now considered to be one of the worst Pokemon games and the start of the downfall of Pokemon. Well, even though I think XY isn't very good, I felt bad for the Kalos region because it has so much potential, just like Diamond and Pearl. You see, the difference between Diamond and Pearl and X and Y is that the Sinnoh games was saved by an excellent third Pokemon game, turning Sinnoh into a fan favorite region that spawned so many fucking stands screaming about a lake music. X and Y never got Pokemon Z, and it's a damn shame because I really liked the atmosphere and the lore of the Kalos region, and it really had good map design, just like Sinnoh. Do you see my point? Yes, a third game is a bit of a scummy business practice, but it's a necessary evil because it leads to good games. Like it or not, it's the lesser evil. Fuck. Anyways, point is, Diamond and Pro were broken, rushed, incomplete games with major potential, and Platinum finished those games expanded the potential. And that's why I love Sinnoh and Pokemon Platinum. So let's talk about how Pokemon Platinum achieved this. Part 1. 
fixing the engine. Let's get the obvious one out of the way, the one obvious problem with Diamond Knight Pro, and that this game is slower than your mom. It runs like fucking PUBG on an original Xbox One. Playing Diamond and Pro these days feel like driving a beatdown car whose engine is about to implode any second. Now, the most common myth of why Diamond and Pro is slow is the slow HP bars. That myth is not true, and I want to debunk it in this video. See, it's not the HP bars dropping slower than that it would take to watch the entire Godfather trilogy that's the problem. The HP bars actually move the same way in Pokemon Platinum and the Jota Remix, which should have been fixed in those games. And thank god it was fixed in Gen 5. Anyways, it's not the HP bars. It's the fact that in battle, after every action on screen such as choosing a move, using a move, putting out a Pokemon, using an item or etc, or whatever, there is a slight 0.5 second delay. As if the game's engine is so buggy, it needs time to process simple math calculations or something. If you don't get what I mean, here's a slight demonstration. A meme song that everyone likes will play every time there's a delay at places there shouldn't and Platinum don't have. You may think this is something minor, but it gets really fucking annoying and it builds up to a shit amount of time. Pokemon DP is the arch enemy of the A button, because you'll be groping that a million times playing this game. Personally, I turn off battle animations when playing DP, and it still feels slow somehow. And it's not just the buggy battle screen engine that makes the game a fucking chore and cancer to play. It takes forever to save in these games, and I swear the wild Pokemon encounter rate is right from the Generation 3 games. Also, the slow surf speed is another problem. But DP's problem with the game's speed doesn't end here. It's little stuff that keeps piling on that makes DP a mountain of slowness. For example, have fun if you pick fucking Piplup up in Diamond and Pro. You're stuck with Bubble until level 24, which means at least 7 hours of having a crappy water type move for your starter. Platinum fixed this at least by lowering the level required for Bubble Beam to level 19. Also, the move's Hypnosis' accuracy was raised from 60 to 70 in this game by some brain genius, so that completely made the move OP and a slow game slower. Also, I swear every Team Galactic member owns a Golbat that knows Confusory, which just makes the game a hassle to play. I'm a Korean man, so it is my Bali Bali culture nationality that makes me hot-headed and impatient. So even though I grew up with the Gen 3 games and had a Nintendo DS when Pokemon Diamond and Pro came out, I couldn't get into the games. I quit Pokemon by the year 2006, and didn't return until the Gen 5 games came out. And the reason I left the franchise was just because I couldn't stand the slow game. Thankfully, I checked out Pokemon Platinum much later in my life, even though I missed it when it came out. And I learned that they actually fixed the slow ass game engine, and I was finally able to get invested in Sinnoh, and learn to learn Sinnoh like the other Sinnoh stands. Part 2. Savior Giratina Now, fixing the game and just so it fucking runs better may be just a quality of life improvement that might not warrant the full new game. So, let's start talking about something really broken with Diamond Pro that Platinum truly fixed which warranted another game, and it's one of the main reasons why I'm pissed off they chose to ignore Platinum with the remakes. And that, my fellow Jerry Cans, believe it or not, is the story. Because Diamond and Pro story is bland as hell, and a complete downgrade from the Generation 3 Pokemon games. Why do I say that? Well, let's start by talking how crappy legendary Pokemon's Dialga and Palkia are. Now, Dialga is one of my favorite Pokemon of all time in terms of design. Conceptually, I love both Dialga and Palkia too, because gods controlling space and time sounds fucking badass. However, Dialga and Palkia and DP is a complete step back compared to Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza, and a terrible duo legendary. It's because... They don't fucking do anything! Let's talk about the whole Spear Pillar event and how lame it is. This is supposed to be the climax of the whole game, and it's just so lame and anticlimactic. Basically, you reach Spear Pillar, Cyrus summons Dialga Palkia, 
Dialga Opankia starts to throw up red, blue, green particles because this game is directed by a Gen Runner. Then, uh, nothing. Uh, guys? I thought you guys are gods that control time and space. Dialga, take us back to 10,000 BC or something. And Palkia, teleport us to a different region. At least something. No? Okay. Dialga or Palkia doesn't even move, and it just patiently sits there for you to battle and catch. Dialga and Palkia in the Smash Bros. stage did more stuff than this game. Uh, let's come back to the previous generation. In Ruby and Sapphire, we got Groudon and Kyogre, gods that control the land and the ocean. They were so powerful they could control the weather. So Groudon and Kyogre actually used their power and does something, which is fucking up the weather. Yeah, it might be simple, but it actually correlates with what their power should be, and they feel like real forces of nature. Dialga and Palkia and DP on the other hand, are just RGB lights in a club that don't move. Also, Groudon made it sunny and Kyogre made it rainy, so their powers were different. Dialga and Palkia act exactly the same, only difference is the sprite. Emerald made the weather tree more cinematic by having Groudon and Kyogre duking it out in the middle of Citopolis City, so you have to go to Spirit Pillar to ring up Rayquaza so those fuckers don't fight. Then we get a cinematic cussing for the first time in Pokemon history, and it was a moment that made every kid cream their pants in their childhood. Well, in the next installment, these fuckers just sit on their ass and do nothing. See why I'm saying DP is a downgrade from Gen 3? So how did Platinum fix this? Hmm. Now we have Cyrus summoning both Diaga and Palkia, but this time, we actually get an animated cinematic cutscene with Yuxi, Mess Spirit, and Azelf showing up to help and break the red chain. I like the sprites just appearing out of thin air in the original games. Then holy fucking shit, Satan appears out of the ground to give Cyrus the look -see, and it looks fucking terrifying for a children's game. Hey there demons, it's me, ya boy. Anyways, Giratina abducts Cyrus into his crib, and you and Cynthia follow them into the distortion world. So let's talk about that world finally. A lot of people seem to underrate the distortion world. Oh, it's just some maze puzzle that was added in before the process of catching the legendary and confronting Cyrus. Well, it is, but it's more than that. Distortion World is a moody, creepy place that's atmospheric, and is a great build-up to the confrontation with Giratina. It actually makes Giratina feel like an actual shadow demon, and it allows Giratina to become an actual cosmic horror monster, which makes it one of the greatest legendary Pokemon. It's called Atmosphere and Effort, a much big improvement than sitting on his ass in a foggy case around by Zubats, wouldn't you say? Distortion World is also the first 3D area in Pokemon that introduced camera angles changing. I always find it disappointing in Diamond and Pearl that the camera was always fixed in a singular angle like a Gen 3 game, even though the overworld is 3D. Well, it's kind of ripping off of Super Mario Galaxy, which was popular at that time, with crazy gravity physics, but it felt amazing to see the camera actually change in here. We finally got many environments like this in the Generation 5 Pokemon games, so think of this as the developer's beta testing and a stepping stone for Unova. Also, Giratina is the first legendary Pokemon to introduce form changes. This feature has become a cliché with many legendary Pokemon copying in the next generation, but back in 2008, when it was first introduced, this was so badass, man! Giratina is so memorable, and it's one of the single reasons why I'm sad it's getting the short end of the stick in the remakes. The entire Sinnoh region feels empty without the presence of Giratina, and Giratina alone makes Sinnoh's story and mythology interesting, instead of the boring funny duddy duo. But, Giratina has to share a bench warmer seat with Zygarde in a cave now, unfortunately. Part 3 Cyrus and the Human Spirit Let's talk about Team Galactic, because I really don't like Team Galactic, because it's another downgrade. The previous generation had two teams, and now we're back to one team, and they all have ridiculous haircuts that makes me ashamed to be a Korean. Also, their leader Cyrus was a really bad antagonist too. The EP version of Cyrus may be the worst antagonist in the entire series. Yes, possibly worse than Luzamine in USUM, Rose in Sword and Shield, and Lissandre in X and Y. Yes, Cyrus in DP is more lame than a Prozidi character. Now, Pokemon Platinum didn't really fix the lameness of Team Galactic, but it managed to fix Cyrus to the point where I would call him one of the best Pokemon villains of all time. Cyrus suffers the same problem with the Algon Palkia and Dominant Pro, and it's the fact that he doesn't do anything! He only shows up four times in the game, and the first two times are brief cameos of him babbling about mythology. You don't really meet him until you storm Team Galactic building, which is dumb. And in the final battle, after you battle and defeat him at Spear Pillar, he just disappears after saying he'll become a god one day. Uh, what? Please clap. Now in Pokemon Platinum, 
Cyrus is still the main antagonist, but his role in the story is much bigger up to the point where he's almost a secondary main character like Ed in Black and White. Cyrus had only spoken about 800 words of dialogue in the original games, but he speaks about 1900 words in Platinum, so you can clearly see his role has gotten bigger. I like how his face shows up in the movie intro of the game, showing how significant to the story he is. He also shows up in the first 5 minutes of the game at Lake Variety, giving players the information that he is an important character. He also shows up at Eternity City's statue to show that he's interested in the legendaries, and at that Celestic Town, he makes it clearly known to the player that he's the boss of Team Galactic. We even get to battle him there, which is a small bonus. Yeah, what a shocker that this blue-haired alien man is their boss, right? Someone drove a hot dog-shaped car through the window! <laughs> Whose car is this? Yeah, come on! Whoever did this, just confess! We promise we won't be mad! My favorite moment with him is this added scene in Platinum where he gives a speech out to some Team Galactic grunts. This scene really gives depth to the character because it really shows what kind of beliefs Cyrus has and makes him one hell of a charismatic leader. Looker also exposits to us that he's only aged 27 somehow. Man, Cyrus needs some lotion on his face or something. Also, the reason why Cyrus is an interesting villain is how much of a hypocrite he is. He keeps talking about how much he wants to get rid of the human spirit and how much he hates emotion. However, he has a Crobat which is a Pokemon that evolves through friendship, right? I think the game developers were being clever here because it's another way to show how much of a hypocrite he is. But the biggest way to show he's a hypocrite is him meeting Giratina. I like how he's calm and cold until Giratina shows up and probably shits his pants when he gets abducted. Then after he gets to the social world, I like how he gets really angry and starts ranting at the player. Ironic for a man who wants to purge emotions, right? After you beat him in a really difficult Pokemon battle and catch Giratina, he proclaims that he'll stay in the distortion world and try to create his perfect world here, and walks away, promising that he'll return one day. That's a pretty bone-chilling way to end a villain story without a happy ending redemption arc, and I have to give Platinum Story Team props for doing that in a kid's game. I also like that little sweet Cynthia, who also got a bigger role through the distortion world by the way, gives after this, talking about how we should treasure human spirit with our life and our relations with Pokemon gives meaning. Wow, a Pokemon game trying to have a message without it being pretentious or having a rush twist villain ending? Platinum might actually trump black and white story quality. What? But you can't do this to me. You know how much I sacrifice? <laughs> alright, alright. Anyways, Platinum made Cyrus go from one of the worst villains of all time to one of the best Pokemon villains of all time. I would argue Cyrus is a fucking boring basic bitch without the distortion world, so it's a shame that he's gonna be a basic bitch in the remakes. Ugh. See why I'm so pissed they're trying to erase Platinum from history with the remakes? You're really gonna throw away an interesting story arc for this? Let me at him! Let me at him! Par 4. Masuda and f 151. F Kanto. F Red, Blue, and Green. F the number 151. F Yunichi Masuda. I'm getting sick and tired of this, but here we are. In my previous videos, I illustrated how Mr. Junichi Masuda has an almost sexual pleasure with the number 151. Go check out my short film if you want the full story. And I'm afraid I might have to make a sequel after the release of BDSP. Anyways, what do I mean all by this? It's the goddamn Sinnoh Pokedex. Even though one of the strengths of the Sinnoh games is that they introduced many new Pokemon and evolutions, Diamond and Pearl had a small Mega Pokedex. And of course, that number was 100 fucking 51. The Pokédex was too small, so left out many new Pokémon such as Rotom, Purple Pass, Ligliki, Togekiss, Tangrowth, Yamega, Rhyferior, and the list goes on and on. These Pokémon were only available to catch in the post-game in Diamond and Pearl, and Platinum fixed this by expanding the Sinnoh Dex to 210, which is adding 60 Pokémon that should have been there. May I ask why? Seriously, why is there only 151? Was Omadin Kanto that much of a fucking deal? Even the previous game Ruby and Sapphire had 200 Pokémon, and that game was directed by Masuda too. I first thought Pokemon with Mew evolutions were cut because Masuda was worried the children might be confused or some fucking shit. But then why does Revile and Miss Magius get into the DP decks? There is really no explanation except trying to homage Kanto, the best generation in region! This arbitrary, forced 151 number limit is another reason that makes Diamond and Pearl one of the worst games in the series. The first major problem, you only have a limited amount of Pokemon you can catch and use. You know how it's a meme that everyone ends up using the starter, Luxray, Staraptor, Lucario, Garchomp, and Floatzel? It's not that these Pokemon designs are good, it's that there's not much Pokemon to catch, so it's bad game design. Pokemon Platinum allows you to use more Pokemon, so god bless my Bipilodomamaswine, 
You did a good job against Cynthia. Can't believe you can't use a Mammoth Swine in Diamond and Pearl, just because of one man's absurd fantasy of a number. Any Routes fan? You think you can catch a Routes next to the Hearthrone City, right? Well, too bad. If you want to use Gallade or Gardevoir, you can use it until the postgame in Diamond and Pearl. The second major problem is the NPCs. Less Pokemon the decks means less variety of Pokemon NPCs used. The most famous is Flint using only two Fire-type Pokemon because there are only two Fire-types in Sinnoh. It's not just him though. Like, why is Steel-type Byron's trainer using an army of Onyxes and one Azumarill for some reason? Is it because Onyx is from the best generation in the region? Or why is that the only Ice-type Pokemon Snowpoint Gym trainers use is Snowware and Sneasel and the rest are random Pokemon? Like, did anyone play test this shit? Was nobody at Game Freak questioning this decision when they were making the game? When they were setting up the teams for Elite for Flint, didn't at least one person ask Directive Daddy Masuda, Uh, should we add more Fire-type Pokemon in the game? Or did that person get 150 more slaps from Masuda for asking too many questions against the best generation in the region? Anyways, Platinum fixed all the issues by doing the bare minimum of expanding the Pokedex to 200, and there are no weird trainers with weird typing. They're seeing a problem again. And for some goddamn reason, the remix decided to faithfully recreate the Domino Pro teams for every NPC. So prepare to see Flint with the best fire type Pokemon Lopunny, a Volkner with an electrifyingly shocking Octillery in BDSP. Motherfucking Kanto at 151. Like, seriously, give me a reason why there's no 200 Pokedex. Why are there no 200 Pokedex? Why are there no fucking 200 Pokedex? <gasps> why? Ah! <laughs> Part 5, From Unfinished to Polished Since we talked about issues fixed, let's talk about things polished. One of the best things that Sir King A do is polish up the game, and there are many things and features in Platinum that were polished to the point that Pokemon Platinum shines more than the actual game named Shining. Many things were polished, so let's start with the opening movie. Personally, the Sinnoh games have my favorite variation of the main Pokemon theme, so I love it. But I always thought the Diamond and Pro movie intros were really boring. Like, black and white Pokemon logo letters with epic music. How boring. Platinum version. Oh my god, it's a fucking blizzard snowstorm! To compare the next opening shot of the Cinder region, the camera of Platinum's version is much more dynamic and energetic. And I can't believe they're even faithfully recreating the inferior version in the remakes. <laughs> the movie gets scary in both versions, but Diamond and Pearl just features some lightning striking Mount Corona in the distance. Boo! How boring! <laughs> Comparing with Platinum, we first get the sinister face of Cyrus that I already talked about. Then holy moly, what is that? The Boogeyman? Red eyes and a wide open red smile? Such a creepy and nice visual, and much more effective than just some distance lightning, right? <laughs> Let's talk about the map too. Even though layout-wise Sinnoh was great, a lot of places in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl's environment felt unfinished or dull as hell. Platinum improved so many places in Sinnoh, making the map beautiful as fuck. Spoilers, none of these places made it into the remake. For example, the Team Galactic buildings. Take a look at how boring Team Galactic buildings are. You call this an evil villain's lair? It's more like a public library, not a fucking base of operations for math genocide. Platinum fixed it by having all the decor be a nice space theme so the environment feel actually like a villain's lair and fits with the music. Believe it or not, the remakes are also faithfully recreating the inferior version because fuck you, it's tradition. Or the Pokemon League Elite 4 rooms. In the original games, everyone was standing in the center of empty, barren rooms. Uh guys, don't you get bored of standing in this place all day? Compare it to Platinum. All the rooms are decorated and look unique, giving each Elite 4 more character and depth. Just compare Cynthia's room from DP to Platinum everything looks so much better. Platinum also had many environments where they managed to control the lighting so the map looks better. For example, they changed the underground section of Mount Cornet to be more darker, so it's more creepy and atmospheric, fitting for a dank cave. Or, they added a dark cloud layer over Eternal Forest to make the forest more haunting since there's a ghost house in it. Also, I like how the top sections of galactic buildings are darker, where you face the boss. It's little details like this that I will miss in the remix, sadly. The post-game area also looks very different too. Sinnoh's mountains and water, looking exactly the same as Gen 3 game sprites, was a pet peeve of mine, but the post-game area in Platinum actually feels new and fresh. Just ignore how a place almost north as Snowpoint City is tropical. 
Additionally, like I said with the distortion world, I was disappointed that a lot of places in Sinnoh didn't utilize the DS's hardware capability, right? Well, that's the most significant with the gym puzzles. None of them use the 3D capability of the DS very well. Really? A forest maze more boring than a Gen 1 puzzle for Eterna Gym? A math quiz for Hearthrow Gym? What is this, Mario's time machine? Platinum fixed Eterna Gym by creating a cool looking clock gimmick, and Hearthrow Gym by doing a darkness light maze dungeon puzzle. Do you see how Platinum predicted Squid Game? It's not just the maps too. I like how for the first time in Pokemon history, important NPCs like gym leaders have animated sprites. It may be a minor thing, but this is personally one of my favorite features from the, all the DS games. It gave so much character and personality in the 2D world, and I was very angry that it was gone in black and white. But Game Freak did us a favor by making all trainers animated in black and white too. Also, every time you battle a gym leader or Elite Four, these things called VS sprites show up on the screen. It's nice to see a close up to the faces and sometimes feeds mm -hmm, of important characters, so they feel more alive than just some battle sprites on a screen. This feature was carried over to the next three games, even the Gen 5 games. And of course, again in the remakes, they're adapting the inferior one. Huh. There are probably more changes and fixes in this game that I can't think of at the moment, and out of all the absurd games, Platinum had the most changes and polishing. All of these are nice changes that make a game more fun. People keep asking me, BDS3 is a DP remake, not Platinum remake. Why are you mad? These are small changes that can be easily implemented in a remake. Why throw them away for an inferior version? Nostalgia or tradition? Just like Junichi Masuda and the number 151? Part 6. Return of Features from Gen 3 Another weird distinct characteristic certain Pokemon games have is that features that were in a previous generation that got deleted in a mute installment returns. For example, the animated sprites in Crystal were deleted in Ruby and Sapphire, were returned in Emerald, animated gym leader sprites with Platinum that were deleted in Black and White, returned in Black and White too. Well, this game has that too. Pokemon Emerald introduced signs popping up on the screen with backgrounds that showed if it was an urban, rural, cave, or water area. Diamond and Pro went back to the old Ruby and Sapphire way of just a blank screen, but Platinum fixed it by having backgrounds and area titles again. Also, Pokemon Emerald were the first game in the series to introduce Gym Leader rematches, and Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green were the first games to introduce Elite Four and Champion rematches. All of these were of course gone in Diamond and Pearl, and thank god, this was the game that finally featured all Gym Leaders, Elite Fours, and Champion rematches. Let's also talk about the major feature that returned, and of course it's... The Battle Frontier, the best running joke of my channel. Where is it? Where the hell is it? Where the hell is it? Okay, stay with me. Even though I keep joking about where, where is, is it? it, believe it or not, I don't really care that much about the Battle Frontier. <gasps> yeah, I know, shocking, right? Personally, I usually play Pokemon games for exploration and Pokemon collecting, so I don't really find satisfaction in battling. However, the reason I keep bringing it up is even though I may not enjoy it as much as others, I don't want content getting cut for the purpose of being lazy, rushed, or cutting corners. Also, Battle Frontier is a good post-game content material, because it gives the player something to do indefinitely after beating the game without needing any story material. Getting gold symbols in these RNG nightmares is really difficult, and I think some people can burn more hours in this thing than the main campaign. I've known many people who spent hundreds of hours trying to beat these hellscapes, and that's a true, efficient post-game. Not some 2-hour story mission, or a legendary Pokemon hunt tacked on at the end of games these days. Oh, I miss you Battle Frontier. Anyways, that being said, the Sinnoh Battle Frontier. I love how it looks. I think the facilities are way more creative than Emerald. I personally enjoy Battle Hall the most, which is a facility where everyone only uses one Pokemon. I love the one-to-one -one fights because it's quick, by sides battles, and, and felt almost like a duel, not a Pokemon battle. The only bad thing about the Battle Frontier I have to say about this version is the Battle Castle. I think having a separate currency made it unnecessary and complicated, and it didn't really have a strong memorable gimmick like the rest of the facilities. Still, I will miss the Battle Frontier of this game. BDSP was the last chance for Pokemon games to bring it back, but the Pokemon Company gave us the middle finger instead, and we'll be stuck with just the Battle Tower again. Goodbye, old friend. I hope this video was a good nostalgia trip for some, and some childhood ruining experience for others. I said in the start of the review, I want to separate Pokemon Platinum from Diamond and Pearl, this misconception of lumping them together. They're very different games, so again, 
That is why I'm not so happy PDSP is choosing the inferior version of the game to remake. Pokemon Platinum is more than just a stupid costume to give us as an early purchase bonus item. Diamond and Pearl are half-baked games that don't need to exist anymore because a much superior game that is better in every way possible exists. Pokemon Platinum made the game actually run in a stable fashion, fixed the story and characters, improved the legendaries, gave a bland villain death, fixed gameplay designs like the limited 1 fucking 51 Pokedex limit, and overall made Sinnoh a much better experience. Why throw that away? Who at Game Freak, Pokemon Company, or LCA thought that adapting the inferior version was a good idea? Why throw away all these improvements? Is this an ego thing with Masuda because he only directed Diamond and Pearl and not Platinum? Seriously, why ignore Platinum? What is the reason? Why? Somebody tell me! It's not fair! Somebody tell me! Do you hear me? I have to know! I have to know! However, before I end the review, I want to say this. This video was a review of Pokemon Platinum and how it fixed Diamond and Pearl, not a Diamond and Pearl review. So I only went over the things Diamond and Pearl did poorly, and didn't talk about the things DP did right. These include the Mew evolutions, the excellent map design of Sinnoh, or the good music. Maybe I'll do a full in-depth Diamond and Pearl review in the future if I have time, but to be honest, there are other Pokemon games and regions I would like to talk about much sooner, and I'll review BDSP when it comes out, so we'll just have to wait and see. Platinum is not a perfect game. There are still issues that Platinum needed to fix, like the battle engine still being slow despite being faster than Diamond and Pearl. Also, like the rest of the Gen 4 games, there were way too many HM moves required and I'm glad the remix will be getting rid of that. The bottom screen still got barely used, and that will be fixed in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. But Platinum is still a very solid game and one of the greatest Pokemon games of all time. It truly was, and will probably be the definitive Sinnoh experience. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, meanwhile, are games that can't even stand on their own in my opinion. Platinum completed Generation 4 and Sinnoh. So, go on eBay auction, those damn cartridges cost a fortune. The price of these things skyrocketed after BDSP was announced and people saw that BDSP ignored Platinum, and Platinum looked better. Money doesn't lie, my fellow Jerrycans. Or just go emulate it after, <clears throat> extracting the file from the cartridge illegally. It's not like Nintendo is making money from these games on their shitty Switch Online system, right?